The following is a conversation with Magnus Carlsen, the number one ranked chess player in the world and widely considered to be one of, if not the greatest chess player of all time. The camera on Magnus died 20 minutes into the conversation. Most folks still just listen to the audio through a podcast player anyway, but if you're watching this on YouTube or Spotify, we did our best to still make it interesting by adding relevant image overlays. I mess things up sometimes, like in this case, but I'm always working hard to improve. I hope you understand. Thank you for your patience and support along the way. I love you all. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Magnus Carlsen. You're considered by many to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest chess players of all time, but you're also one of the best fantasy football, aka soccer competitors in the world, plus recently picking up poker and uh, competing at a world-class level. So before chess, let's talk football and greatness. Uh, you're a Real Madrid fan, so let me ask you the ridiculous big question. Who do you think is the greatest football, aka soccer player of all time? Can you make the case for Messi? Can you make the case for Cristiano Ronaldo, Pele, Maradona? Does somebody, anybody jump to mind? No, I think it's pretty hard to make a case for anybody else than, uh -oh. than Messi for his, uh, for his all-around game. And... Uh, uh, frankly, like my Real Madrid fandom sort of uh, predates the Ronaldo era, era uh, the the second Ronaldo, not 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 the first one. So I always liked Ronaldo, but I always kind of thought that Messi was uh, was uh, better. Uh, and um, I went to quite a number of uh, Madrid games, and they've always been super helpful full to me down there. The only thing is that, like, they asked me they were going to do an interview and they were going to ask me who my favorite player was. And um, I said somebody else, I, I think I said Isco at that point. And I was like, okay, take two. Now you say Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> so for them, it was, um, it was very important, but it wasn't, wasn't that huge to, um, uh, to me. So Messi over Maradona. Yeah, but it's, I think it, just like with chess, it's hard to compare eras. Um, obviously, the improvements in football have been, like, in in technique and such, have been even greater than they have been in 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 chess. But it's um, it's always um, it's always a weird weird discussion uh, to, to have. But just as a fan, what do you think is beautiful about the game? What defines greatness? Is it, you know, with Messi, one, he's really good at finishing. Two, very good at assist. Like three, there's just magic. It's just beautiful to see the play. So it's not just about the finishing. There's some, it's like Maradona's hand of God. There's some creativity on the pitch. Is is that important or is it very important to get the World Cups and the big championships and that kind of stuff? I think the World Cup is pretty pretty overrated seeing us <laughs> um, as it's uh, such a small sample size. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it sort of annoys me always when you know titles are always um, always appreciated so much, um, even though uh, that particular title can be can be a lot of a uh, lot of uh, luck or at least some at least some luck. Um, uh, so I do appreciate um, the statistics a bit, and all the statistics say that Messi is the best uh, finisher of all time, which I think helps a lot. Um, and then there's the intangibles as well. The flip side of that is the small sample size is what really creates the magic. It's so rare, it's just like the Olympics. You, you basically train your whole life for this. You live your whole life for this. And it's a rare moment, one mistake and it's all over. That's for some reason, a lot of people either break under that pressure or rise up under that pressure. You don't, you don't admire the magic of that. No, I, I do. I just think that like rising and to the pressure and breaking under, under the pressure is often a really oversimplified like uh, take yeah. on, on what's, um, on what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> we were, yeah, we do romanticize the game. Yeah. Well, let me ask you another ridiculous question. Another, you're also a fan of basketball. Yes. <laughs> Let me ask the goat question. The uh, I, you know, I'm biased because uh, I went to high school in Chicago. 
uh, you know, Chicago Bulls during the, the Michael Jordan era. Uh, let me ask the the Jordan versus LeBron James question. Let's let's continue on this thread of greatness. Which one do you pick, or somebody else? Matthew so Johnson. I'll give you a completely different answer. Uh oh. Um, depending on my mood and depending who on whom I talk to, I pick one of one of the two, and then it's, I try to argue for it's that. It's the quantum mechanical thing. Well, can, can you what again? What what would uh, if you were to argue for either one? Statistically, I think LeBron James is going to surpass Jordan. Yeah, no doubt. And so again, there's a. Um, debate between unquantifiable greatness no that i mean that's the whole that's the whole debate yes so it's well it's quantifiable versus unquantifiable yeah what's more important and you're depending on mood yeah all over the place yeah. <laughs> but what do you lean in general with these fo- with these folks with, with with soccer with anything in life towards the unquantifiable more no definitely towards the quantifiable so when you're unsure, lean towards the numbers. Yeah. But see, like it's later generations. There's something that's what people say about Maradona is, you know, he took a arguably somewhat mediocre team to to a World Cup. So there's that also uplifting nature of the player to be able to rise up the whole. T- it is a team sport. So are you gonna like? Are you go- are gonna punish um, Messi for? Taking a mediocre Argentine squad to to the to the final in 2014 and punish him because they lost to a great team very narrowly after they missed. The he he, sa- <laughs> he set up like a great chance for Iguain in the first half, which he um, which he fluffed, and then yeah, eventually they lost the game. Yeah, they, they they do criticize Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi for being on really strong squads in terms of the club yeah. teams. And saying, yeah, okay, it's easy to, when you have uh, like Ronaldinho or whoever uh, on your team. It would be very interesting just um, if the league could make a decision. Yeah, just random, random yeah. allocation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and just every single game, just keep re- reallocating, or maybe once a season, um, or every season you get random. Yeah, but but let, let's say every every player. Um, if let's say they sign a five-year contract for a team, like one of them, you're going to get randomly allocated to, to let's say a bottom half team. <laughs> I, I bet you there's going to be so much corruption around that. It'll be no, I mean, obviously it wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't ever happen or or, yeah. or work. But I think it's, it's you never know. Interesting to think about. So on chess, let's uh, zoom out. If you break down your approach to chess, when you're at your best. Oh, what what do you think um, what do you think contributes to that approach? Is it memory recall, specific lines and positions? Is it intuition? How much of it is intuition? How much of it is pure calculation? How much of it is messing with the strategy of the opponent? So the game theory aspect, in terms of what contributes to the highest level of play that um, that you do. I think the answer differs a little bit now from what it did eight years ago uh for instance like i've i feel like i've had like two peaks in in my career in 2014 uh well 2013 2014 and also in 2019 and in those years i i was very different um in terms of um of my strength Strengths uh, specifically in 2019, I benefited a lot from opening preparation. Uh, while in 2013, 2014, I mostly tried to avoid my uh, opponent's uh, preparation rather than that being a um, being a strength. So uh, I'm, I'm mentioning that also because it's something something I didn't um, didn't mention. I think like my intuitive understanding of chess has over those years always been a little bit better than the others even though it has evolved as well um certainly there are there are things that i understand now that i didn't understand back then but that's not only for me that's for um for others as well um i was younger back then so i played with more energy which meant that i could play better in long drawn out uh 
games, um, which was also a necessity for me because I didn't, I couldn't, couldn't beat people in the, in the openings. Um, but it, in terms of calculation, that's always been a weird issue for me. Like I've always been really, really um, bad at solving exercises in chess. Like that's been like a blind spot for me. First of all, I found it hard to concentrate on them um, and to look uh, to look deep enough. So this is like a puzzle, a position, yeah, yeah. mate in X. I mean, one thing is mate, but find the best move. That's find generally the exercise. Like find the best move, find the best line. You <laughs> you just don't connect with it. Usually like you have to to look look deep. And then when I get these lines during the game, I very often find the 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 right solution, even though um even though I'm, it's not still um, uh, the best part of my game uh, to to calculate very, very deeply. But it doesn't feel like calculation. You're saying, in terms of no, it, you know. it does sometimes. But for me, it's more like I'm at the board trying to find trying to find the solution, and I understand like the training at home is like trying a little bit to to replicate that. Like you give somebody half an hour. Um, in a position like in this instance, you might have thought for half an hour if you played a game, but I just, I just cannot do it. Uh, one thing I know that I am good at though uh, is um, calculating short lines because uh, I calculate them them well. I'm good at seeing um, little details, and I'm also much better than than most at uh, evaluating. Uh, which I think is something that sets me uh, sets me uh, apart from from others. So evaluating specific position, if I if I make this move and the position changes in this way, is this the a step in the right direction, like in a big picture way? Yeah, like you calculate a few moves ahead and then you evaluate because a lot of lot of time, a lot of the times you cannot. Um, the branches become so big that you cannot calculate everything. So you have like a to, fog. Yeah. So you have to you have to make valuations based on you know based mostly mostly on knowledge and and intuition. And somehow I seem to do that uh, pretty well. When you say you're good at short lines, what's that? What's what's short? That's usually like lines of um, two to four moves each. Okay, so that that's directly applicable to even faster games like blitz, chess, and so on. Yeah, um, blitz is uh, a lot about cal calculating force lines. So those you can see pretty clearly that the players who struggle at blitz, who are great at classical, are those who rely on a deep calculating ability because you simply ha don't have time for for that in blitz. You have to calculate quickly and rely a lot on intuition. Can you try to? I know it's really difficult. Can you try to talk through what's actually being visualized in your head? Is there is there a visual component? Yeah. No, I just visualize the board. I mean, the board is in. It's in is in my head. Two dimensional. My interpretation is that it's it is two uh, two dimensional. Like what colors is is it brown tinted? Is it black? Is it uh, like what's the theme? Is it a big board, small board? Are the uh, what do the pawns look like? <laughs> or is it more in the space of concepts? Like uh, is, yeah, is, the, is, the, there are, <laughs> there aren't a lot of colors. It's it's mostly. Uh, <laughs> What is it? Queen's I'm, Gambit I'm trying, on the ceiling, I'm whatever. Right now to, uh, to, <laughs> to imagine it. What about when you do the branching? When you have multiple boards and so on? What? How does that look? Are you, no, but it's look? only one at a time. So like one position at a time. One position at a time. So then I go back, and uh, and that's what when when people play, or at least that's what I do when I play blindfold chess against several people. Then it's just always one board at a time, and the rest are stored away somewhere. But how do you store them away? So like you went down one branch and you're like, all right, that's, I got that. I understand that that's, there's some good there. There's some bad there. Now let me go down another branch. Like how do you store away the information? You just put it on a shelf kind of 
I, I try and store it away. Sometimes I have to sort of repeat it because I forget. Um, and it does happen frequently in games that um, you're thinking for, especially if you're thinking for long, let's say a half an hour, or even more than that, that you play a move and then your opponent plays a move, then you play a move and they play a move again and you realize, oh, I actually calculated that. I just forgot about it. Mm. Um, so that's obviously what happens when you store the information and you cannot retrieve it. When you think about a move for 20, 30 minutes, like how do you break that down? What Can you describe what, like what's the algorithm here that takes 30 minutes to run? 30 minutes is, uh, at least for me, it's usually a waste. Um, 30 minutes usually means that I don't know what to do. <laughs> and I'm trying- You're just to, running into the wall over uh, and yeah, over. Yeah, I'm trying to find something that isn't there. I think um, 10 to 15 minutes thinks in complicated positions can be really, really uh, helpful. Then you can spend your time pretty um, efficiently. Um, just, it just means that the branches are getting getting wide. There's a, there's a lot to, um, to run through, um, both in terms of calculation and lots you have to evaluate as well. And then based on, based on that 10 to 15 minute think you, you have a pretty good idea, uh, what to, what to do. I mean, it's, it's very rare that I would think for half an hour and I would have a eureka moment during the game. Like if I haven't seen it in 10 minutes, I'm probably not going to see it at all. You're going to different branches. Yeah. And like after 15 minutes, it's like... But it mainly to the middle game. Because when you get to the end game, it's usually brute force calculation that makes you spend so much time. So middle game is normally... It's 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 a complicated mix of brute force calculation and and uh, and um, by creativity and, and evaluation. So end game, it's, it's, it's more, it's, it's easier in that sense. Well, you're good at every aspect of chess, but you're also, your end game is legendary. It baffles experts. So, uh, can, can you linger on that then try to explain what the heck is going on there? Like if you look at game six of the previous world championship, uh, the longest game ever played in chess, what it was, um, uh, I think uh, his queen versus your rook knight and two pawns. Yeah, there's so many options there. It's such an interesting little little dance, and it's kind of not obvious that it wouldn't be a draw. So how do you escape the it not being a draw, and you win that match? No, I knew um, that for most of the time it was a theoretical draw, since um, chess with seven or less pieces on the board is solved. Mm -hmm. So you can, like people who are watching online, they can just check it. They can yeah. check and they can check a so-called table base and they it just gonna spit out win for white, win for black or a draw. So, and and also I, I knew that, uh, I knew that, didn't know that position specifically, but I knew that it had to be a draw. So for me, it was about staying alert First of all, trying to look for the best way to put my pieces. Uh, but but yeah, those end games are a bit, they're a bit unusual. They don't happen too often. So what I'm usually good at is I'm using my my strengths that I also use in, in middle games is that I um, evaluate well and I calculate short variations quite um, even for the end game short variations matter yes it does matter in some simpler end games yeah but also like there are these theoretical end games with very few pieces like rook knights uh and two pawns versus queens but a lot of end games are simply defined by the queens being exchanged mm -hmm. and there are a lot of other pieces left and then it's usually not brute force it's usually more of um, understanding and evaluation, and then then I can use my my strengths um, very well. Why are you so damn good at the end game? Isn't there a lot of moves from when the end game starts to when the end game finishes, and you have a few pieces, and you have to figure out? It's like a sequence of little games that happens, right? Like little pattern. Like how how does it being able to evaluate a single position lead you to? evaluate a long sequence of positions that eventually lead to a checkmate. 
Well, I think if you evaluate well at the start, you know what plans to go for. And then usually the play from there is is often pretty simple. Let's say you understand how to arrange your pieces and often also how to arrange your pawns early in the end game, then that makes all all the um, all the difference and after that is like what we call technique of very often uh that it's technique basically just mean means that um the moves are simple and uh these are moves that you know a lot of players could could make not only not only the very strongest ones these are moves that are kind of understood and, and known so yeah, with the evaluation you just constantly improving a little bit and that just leads to suffocating the position and then eventually to the win as long as you're doing the evaluation well one step at a time to some extent also yeah as i said like if you evaluate it better and thus accumulated some some small advantages then you can you can often make your 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 life pretty easy uh, towards the end of the end game so you said in uh 2019 sort of the second phase of why you're so damn good. <laughs> you uh, you did a lot of opening preparation. What's the goal for you of uh, the opening game of chess? Is it to throw the opponent off from any prepared lines? Is there something you could put into words about why you're so damn good at the openings? Again, these things have changed a lot over time. Uh, back in Kasparov's days, for instance, um, he very often got huge advantages from the opening as as white can you explain why there were several reasons for for that first of all he he worked harder he was more creative and finding ideas he was able to look places others didn't uh, also he had a very strong team of people who had specific strengths in in openings that he could use so they would come up with ideas and he would he would integrate those ideas into the- like, Yeah, and he would also very often come up with them them himself. Also, uh, at the start, he had um, some of the first computer engines to uh, to work um, for him to, to find his ideas, to look deeper, to verify his ideas. He was better at using them than a lot of others. Now, I f- feel like the playing field is a lot more level there are both computer engines neural networks and hybrid engines available to practically anybody so it's it's much harder to find ideas now that um that actually like give you an advantage with the 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 white pieces i mean people don't expect to find those ideas anymore now it's all about finding ideas that are missed by the uh, engines. Either they're missed entirely or they're missed at low depth. Uh, and using them to, you know, gain some advantage in the sense that you have more more knowledge. And, uh, you know, it's also good to know that usually you, these are not complete bluffs. These are like semi-bluffs so that <laughs> you know that even if your opponent makes all the right moves, you can still make a draw. And also at the start of 2019, neural networks had just started to be a thing in in, in chess. And uh, I'm not entirely sure, but there, there were at least some players in even in the top events you, who you could see did not use them or did not use them in the right way. And then you could gain a huge advantage because a lot of positions, they were being evaluated differently by the neural networks than traditional chess engines because they simply think about uh, chess in a very, very um, different way. So short answer is these days, it's all about surprising your your opponent and taking it into position where you have more more knowledge. So is there some sense in which it's okay to make suboptimal quote unquote moves? No, just- but you have to. I mean, you you have to, because the best moves have been analyzed to to death mostly. So that's a kind of when you say semi bluff, that's a kind of sacrifice. You're you're sacrificing the optimal move, the optimal position, 
so that you can take the opponent. I mean, that's a game theoretic sense. Yeah. You take the opponent to something they didn't prepare well. Yeah, uh, but you could also look at it another way that regardless, like if you turn on whatever engine you turn on, like if you try to analyze either from the starting position or the starting position of some popular opening, like if you um, analyze long enough, it's always going to end up in a draw. So in, in that sense, you may not be going for like the objective, the tries that are objectively the most difficult to draw against, but you know, you are trying to look at least at, at the less obvious um, paths. Um, How much do you use engines? Do you use Leela, Stockfish uh, in your preparations? My team does. Mm -hmm. Personally, I try not to use them too much on on my own uh, because I know that when I play, you can obviously cannot have help from from engines, and often I feel like often having imperfect or knowledge about a position uh, or some engine knowledge can be a lot worse than than having no knowledge. Uh, yeah. So I try to look at engines as little as possible. So the, yeah, so the, your team uses them for research, for generation of ideas, Yeah, but you are uh, relying primarily on your human resources. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you can evaluate well. You don't leave. Yeah, no, I can evaluate as a human. I can know what yeah. they find unpleasant and 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 so on. And the, it's very often the case for me to some extent, but a lot for for others that you arrive in a position and your opponent plays a move that you didn't expect. And you know, if you didn't expect it, you know that it's probably not a great move mm -hmm. <laughs> since it hasn't been expected by by the engine, but. If it's not, if it's not obvious why it's not a good move, it's usually very very hard to figure it out. And so then, looking at the engines doesn't necessarily help because at that point, like you're facing a human, you have to to sort of think as a human. I was chatting with the Demis Asaba, CEO of DeepMind, a couple of days ago, and he asked me to ask you about what you first felt when you saw the the, the play of Alpha Zero. Like it, interesting ideas, any creativity? Um, did you feel fear that the machine is taking over? Did you were you inspired? <laughs> and and you, what what was going on in your mind and heart? Funny thing about Demis is he he doesn't play chess at all, uh, like uh, like an AI. <laughs> uh, he uh, plays in a very very human way. No, uh, I was hugely inspired when I I saw the games at first. Um, and in terms of man versus machine, I mean, that battle was was kind of lost for humans even before I entered top level chess. Um, so that's never been an issue uh, for me. I never, never liked playing against computers much anyway. So, so that's completely fine. But it was amazing to see uh, how they quote unquote thought about chess and in such a different way and in a way that you could mistake for creativity. Mistake for creative, strong words. Uh, is it wild to you how many sacrifices it's willing to make that like sacrifice pieces and then wait for prolonged periods of time before doing anything with that. Is that is that weird to you that that's part of chess? No, oh, it's also? it's one of the things that's hardest to replicate as a human as well, or at least for my playing playing style. That usually when I I sacrifice, I feel like I'm you know I don't do it unless I feel like I'm getting something like tangible uh, in in return and. Um, like a few moves down the line. A few moves down the line, you can see that you can either retrieve the material or you can put your opponent's king under pressure or have some very, like, very concrete uh, positional advantage that sort of um, compensates uh, for it. Uh, for instance, in chess, so bishops and knights are fairly equivalent. Mm -hmm. Um, we both give them three points, but bishops are a little bit better. And especially a bishop pair is a lot better than than a bishop and a knight. So, or especially two knights. Depends on the position, but like on average they are. So like uh, sacrificing a pawn in order to get 
get a bishop pair, that's one of the most common sacrifices in Chinese. Oh, you're okay making that sacrifice? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the situation, right. but generally that's fine. And there are a lot of openings that are based on that, that you sacrifice a pawn for the bishop pair, and then eventually it's some sort of positional equality. Um, so that's fine. But um, the way Alpha Zero would, would sacrifice a knight or sometimes two pawns, three pawns, and you could see that it's looking for some sort of positional domination, but it's it's hard to understand. And it's um, it was really fascinating to see. Um, yeah, in 2019, I was sacrificing a lot of a lot of pawns, especially, and it was uh, it was a great joy. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to continue to do that. People people have found more solid opening lines since that don't allow me to, to do that as often. I'm still trying both to get those positions and still trying to to learn the art of, of sacrificing pieces. So uh, Demis also made a comment that was interesting to my noob chess brain, which is one of the reasons that chess is fun is because of the quote, creative tension between the bishop and the knight. So you're talking about this interesting, um, difference between the two pieces, that there's some kind of, how would you convert that? I mean, that's like a poetic statement about chess. I think he said that, why has chess been played for such a long time? Why is it so fun to play at every level? That if you can reduce it to one thing, is is it's the bishop and the, and the knight, some kind of weird dynamics that they create in chess. Is there any truth to that? It sounds very good. I haven't tried a lot of other games, but I tried to play a little bit of shogi. Mm -hmm. And for my noob shogi brain, mm -hmm. um, comparing it to chess, what annoyed me about that game is how much the pieces suck. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have one rook and you have one bishop that move like in chess, yeah. and the rest of the pieces are really not very powerful. So I think that's one of the attractions of chess, like how powerful, especially the queen is, which interesting. I kind of think makes it makes it a lot of fun. So you, you think power is more fun than like variety? <laughs> no, there is variety in chess as well, though. To, but not much more so than like, like, no, go, no, go no, or something. A, no, 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 that's for so like night. I mean, they, they all move in different ways. They're all like weird. There's just all these weird patterns and positions that can emerge. The difference in the pieces create all kinds of interesting dynamics, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I guess it is quite fascinating that all those years ago they created the knight and the bishop without probably realizing that they would be almost equally equally strong with such different qualities. That's uh, crazy that this, you know, the, the, like when you design computer games, it's it's like an art form. It's a science and an art to to balance it. You know, you talk about StarCraft and all those games, like so that you can have competitive play at the highest level with all those different units. And in, in the case of chess, it's different pieces, and they somehow designed a game that was super competitive. But there's probably some kind of natural selection that the chess just wouldn't last if it, it was designed poorly. Yeah, and I think the the, the rules have changed over time a little little bit but i would be i mean speaking of games and all that i'm also interested to play other other games like chess 960 or fisher random as they call it like that you have 960 maps instead of one yeah so for people who don't know a fisher random chess chess 960s yeah that basically just means that the pawns are in the same way and the major pieces are uh, distributed randomly on the on the last rank. Only that there have to be obviously bishops of opposite color, and the king has to be in between the rooks so that you can castle both ways. Oh, you can still castle and in, in, you in can Chester still 16. castle, but that makes it interesting. So you still have it still castles in the same way. So let's say the king is like here yeah, the, yeah. What happens in that case? Yeah, the, let's say the king is in the corner. Um, so to to castle this side, you have you have to clear a whole lot of pieces. Uh, well, what would castling the king, look like, though? No, the king would go here, and the rook would go there. Oh, okay. Um, and that's happened in my games as well. Like I forgot about castling, 
uh, and I'd be like attacking a king over here, and then all of a sudden it, it escapes to the other side. I think um, I think Fisher Chest is is good that it it's the maps will generally be worse than regular chest. Like I think the starting position is as close to ideal for creating a competitive game as possible, but they will still be like interesting and diverse enough that you can play very, um, very interesting games. So when you say maps, there's 960 different options and like what fraction of that creates interesting games at the highest level? I mean, th th this is something that a lot of people are curious about because uh, when you challenge a great chess player like yourself to, uh, to look at a random starting position, that feels like it pushes you to play pure chess versus memorizing lines. Oh yeah, for sure, stuff. or for sure. But that's that's the whole idea. Yeah, that's what you want. And uh, how hard is it to play? I mean, can you talk about what what it feels like to you to play with a random starting position? Is there some like, intuition you've been building up? It's very very different. And I mean, understandably, engines have an even greater advantage in 960 than they have in in classical chess. No, it's it's super interesting. Uh, and that's why also I really wish that we uh, played more classical chess, like long games, four to seven hours in, in um, Fish Random Chess, Chess 960, because then you really need, you really need that time, even on the first moves. What what usually happens is that you get 15 minutes before the game. You you're getting told the position 15 minutes, minutes before the game, and then you uh, you can think about it li a little bit. Even you know check the computer, but mm -hmm. that's all the time you have. But then you really need to figure it out. And like some of the positions obviously are a lot more interesting in, than the others. In some of them, it appears that like if you don't play symmetrically at the start, then you're probably going to be in a pretty bad bad position. What do you mean with the pawns? Or with what? the pawns, yeah. Why? why so, how does so that that's make the sense? thing about that's the thing about chess, though. So let's say white opens with e4, which is which has always been the most played move. There are many ways to meet that, but the, the most solid ways of playing has always been the symmetrical response. Yeah. Uh, with e5, and then there's the the Rui Lopez, there's the um, there's the Petrov opening, and 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 so on, and if you just ban symmetry on the first move in chess, you would get more interesting games. <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, or you, you'd get more decisive um, decisive games. So that's the good thing about chess is that we've played it so long that we've actually devised non-symmetrical openings that are also fairly equal. Mm -hmm. And But uh, symmetry but, is a good but, default. But, but yeah, symmetry is a good default. And, and it's a problem that... By playing symmetrical, armed with good preparation, in in regular chess, it's just a little bit too, too easy. To uh, it's a little bit too too dryish. And um, I guess if you analyzed, if you analyzed a lot in in chess nine sixty, then um, the um, a lot of the position would end up be being um, pretty dryish as well. Um, but because oh, the random starting point is so, so shitty, you're forced to. You're actually forced to play symmetrically. Like you cannot actually try and play in a more sort of interesting, uh, interesting manner. Uh, is there any other kind of variations that are interesting to you? Oh yeah, uh, there are. There are several. Uh, so no castling chess has been uh, ha has been promoted by former world champion Vladimir Kramnik. There have been a few tournaments with that. Not any that I've participated in though. Um, I kind of like it. Also my coach uses like non-castling engines quite a bit to analyze re regular positions to just to get a different different perspective. So, um, so castling is like a defensive thing. So if you remove castling, it forces you to be more offensive. Is that why? Or? Yeah, it just, yeah, for, for, for sure. Um, it seems like a tiny I, I think little it, difference. It, um, no castling probably forces you to be a little bit more defensive at the start, or I would guess so, mm -hmm. because you cannot suddenly escape with um, with with the kings. That it, it's going to make the game a bit slower at the start, but uh, I feel like eventually it's gonna um, 
uh, it's going to make the more games more um, uh, well less droish for for sure. Uh, then you have some weirder variants like um, where the pawns can move both uh, diagonally and um, and forward. Uh, and also you have self capture chess, which is quite interesting. So that pawns can, or um, like su could commit suicide, or what? yeah, people can. Why would that be a use a good move? No, s sometimes one of your pieces occupy a square. I mean, uh, let me just set up a position. Let's put put it like put it like this. Uh, for instance, like here. I mean, there are a lot of ways to checkmate for white, like this, for instance, or there are several ways. Mm -hmm. um, but like this would be uh, would be. Uh, <laughs> oh, cool! Uh, for people who are just listening, yeah, basically you bring in a, a knight close to the the, the whole the, the the king, the queen, and so on, yeah. and you replace the knight with a queen. Yeah, that's interesting. So you have like a a front of of uh pieces and then you just replace them with the with the second yeah piece. uh that that's cool. i mean that could be interesting i think also maybe sometimes in it's just clearance basically yeah. it adds an extra element of uh of uh, of clearance so uh, i think there there are many um many uh different variants i don't think any of them are better than the one that has been played for uh at least a thousand years but um it's <laughs> yeah. certainly interesting to um, to see. So one of your goals is to reach the FIDE ELO chess rating of 2,900. Maybe you can comment on how is this rating calculated and what does it take to get there? Is it possible for a human being to get there? Basically, you play with a factor of um, 10, uh, which means that if I were to play against um, an opponent who's rated the same as me, I would be expected to score fifty percent, obviously, and that means that I would win five points with a win, uh, lose five points with a draw, and then equal if I if I draw. If your opponent is two hundred points lower rated, you're expected to score seventy five percent, and 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 so on. And you establish that rating by playing a lot of people, and then it slowly yeah. converges towards an estimate of how likely you are to win or lose against different. Yeah, people. Yeah, and. Uh, my rating is obviously carried through thousands of of games. Um, right now, my rating is twenty eight sixty one, which is decent. Like I think that pretty much corresponds to uh, to the level I have at at the moment. Uh, which means, in order to reach twenty nine hundred, I would have to either get better at chess, which I think is fairly hard to to do at least considerably better so what i would need to do is try and optimize even more in terms of the matchups the preparations everything but not 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 necessarily like selecting tournaments and so on but like just optimizing in terms of of preparation like making sure i'm um, I never have any bad days, and you so you basically can't lose. Yeah, I basically can't fuck up ever uh, <laughs> if I wanna if if I wanna reach that goal. And so I I think reaching twenty nine hundred is pretty unlikely. Um, the reason I've set the goal is to have something to to play for, to have like to have a motivation to actually try and and be at my best when I play because otherwise I'm playing to some extent mostly for for fun these days uh, in that I love to play I love to try and win but I don't have like a lot to uh, I don't have a lot a lot to prove or anything uh, but that gives me at least the motivation to try and try and be at my best all, all the time which I think is something to um, to to aim for so at the moment i'm quite enjoying that process of um uh of trying to um yeah trying to optimize what would you say motivates you in this now and in the years leading up to now the love of winning or the fear of losing so for the world championship it's been fear of losing for sure other tournaments love of winning is a great great factor and that's why i also get more joy from, from winning most tournaments than i do for winning the world championship because then it's mostly been a 
a relief. I also think I enjoy winning more now than I did before because I feel like I'm a little bit more relaxed now. Mm -hmm. And um, I also know that it's, you know, it's not gonna last forever. So every every little win I I appreciate um, appreciate a lot more now. And in yeah, in terms of fear fear of losing, like that's a huge reason why I'm not gonna play the world championship because uh, I it really didn't didn't give me give me a lot of joy. It, it really was all about avoiding losing. Why is it that the world championship really makes you feel this way? The anxiety. So, and when you say losing, do you mean not just the match, but like every single position, like, like no, the, it's just, the, the it, fear of a blunder? No, I mean, the blunder is okay. Like when I sit down at the board, then it's it's mostly been fine because then, I, then I'm focused on- Got it. Then I'm focused on the game. And I know, I know that I can play the game. It's a time like in between, like knowing that, you know, I feel like losing is not an option because it's the world championship. And because in a world championship, there are two players. There's a, there's a winner and a loser. If I don't win a random tournament that I play, then, you know, I'm usually, it depends on the tournament. I might be disappointed for sure. Might even be pretty pissed, but ultimately, you know, you go on to the next one. With the world championship, you don't go on to the next one. It's like, it's years. Yeah. And it also has been like, it's been a core part of my identity for a while now that I am world champion. And so there's not an option of of losing that. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh you're gonna have to at least for a couple of years carry the the weight of having lost. You're the former world champion now, if you lose, versus the current world champion. There are certain sports that create that anxiety and others that don't. For example, I think UFC like mixed martial arts are a little better with losing. It's understood, like everybody loses, uh, but there's- Not everybody though. Not everybody, <laughs> not everybody, not everybody. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Khabib entered the chat. Uh, <laughs> but in boxing, there is like that extra pressure of like maintaining the championship. I mean, maybe you could say the same thing about the, the UFC as well. So for you personally, for a person who loves chess, the first time you won the world championship, that was that was the big, that was the thing that was fun. Yeah. And then um, everything after is like stressful. Yeah. Uh, essentially. There was certainly stress uh, involved the first time as well, um, but it was nothing compared to, uh, compared to the others. So the only world championship after that that I really enjoyed was the one in 2018 against the American Fabiano Caruana. Mm -hmm. And what that made that different is that I'd been kind of slumping for a bit and he'd been on the rise. So our ratings were very, very similar. They were so close that if at any point during the, during the match I'd lost the game, um, he would have been ranked as number one in the world. Like our ratings were so close that for each draw, they didn't move. Mm -hmm. And and the game itself was close. Like, yeah, the games the play. themselves were very close. Uh, I I had a, a winning position in, in the first game that I couldn't really get anywhere for a lot of games. Then he, he had a couple of games where he could potentially have won. Um, then in the last game, I was a little bit better. And eventually they, they were all they were all drawn. But I felt like all the way that this is an interesting match against an, an opponent who is at this position, uh, at this point equal to me. And so losing that would not have been a disaster. Because it all, in all the other matches, I would know that I would have lost against somebody who I know I'm much better than. And that would be, would be a lot harder for me to, um, to take. Well, that's fascinating and beautiful that the stress isn't from losing this because you have fun. You enjoy playing against somebody who's as good as you, maybe better than you. That's exciting to you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's losing at this high stakes thing that only happens rarely to a person who's not as good as you. Yeah. And that's yeah. why it's also been incredibly frustrating in other matches. Like when I know when we play draw after draw, and I can just, I, I know that I'm better. I can 
sense during the game that I understand it better than them, but I cannot, you know, I cannot get over the hump. So you are the best chess player in the world and you not playing the world championship really makes the world championship not seem important. Or, I mean, there's an argument to be made for that. Um, is there anything you would like to see if you had a change about the world championship that would make it more fun for you? And better for the game of chess period for everybody involved? So I think 12 games or now 14 games that there is for the world championship is a fairly, fairly low sample size. If you want to determine who the best player is, or at least the best player in that particular matchup, you need more more games. And I, I think, to some extent, if you're going to have a world champion and call them the best players, you best player, you got to make sure that the format increases the chance of finding finding the best player. So I think having more games, and if you're going to have a lot more games, then you need to then you need to decrease the time control a bit, which in turn I think is also uh, a good thing because in very long time controls with deep preparation, you can sort of mask a lot of your deficiencies as 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 a chess player um, with uh, because you have a lot of time to to think and to defend and also yeah you have deep preparation. Um, so I think those would be. For me to play, uh, those would be the the main the main um, the main things. More more games and and less time. So you want to see more games and uh, rules that emphasize pure chess. Yeah, but already less time emphasize emphasizes pure pure chess because um, defensive techniques are are much harder to execute with with little time. What do you think? Is there a sweet spot in terms of are we talking about blitz? Is it how many? I think minutes? blitz is a bit too fast. Yeah. Um, to their credit, this was suggested by by Fida as well. For a start, to have two games per day, and let's say you have forty five minutes uh, a game plus fifteen or or thirty seconds per move, that means that each sessions will probably be about or a little less than two hours. Yeah. That would be would be a start. Also, what what we're playing in the tournament that I'm playing here in 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 Miami, which is um, four games a day uh, with uh, 15 minutes plus 10 seconds per move. Oh, wow. Those were would be um, more interesting than than the one there is now. And I I understand that there are a lot of traditions. People don't want to change the world championship. That's that's all fine. I just think that um, the world championship should do a better job of trying to reflect who who's the best overall chess player. So would you would you say like if it's faster games you'd probably be able to get a sample size of like over 20 games, 20, 30, 40. You think there's a number that's good over a long period of time? Well, I would prefer as many as possible. So like 100. <laughs> um yeah, but let's say you play 12 days to games a day. You know that's twenty four. Yeah. I feel like that's already quite a bit better. You play like one black game, one white game each day. Uh, Endurance wise, that's okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. Like you will have free days as well, so I don't think that will be will be a problem. Um, and also, you have to prepare two sets of openings for each day, which makes it more difficult for the teams preparing. Yeah, which I think is also good. Let me ask you a fun question: If uh, Hikaru and Nakamura. Uh, was one of the two people. Uh, what uh, I guess I apologize. Uh, it, yeah, he could have. He could have finished second. Yeah. So he lost the last round of the candidates. Yeah. And you uh, put maybe you can explain to me. Internet speak. Copium is something you tweeted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if he if he got second, w would you uh, all, would you would you <laughs> just despite him still still play the world championship? That's internet question. And when the internet asks, I must abide. The dude okay. abides. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sure. Thank you, Internet. <laughs> so after the last match, uh, I did an interview uh, r right after where I talked about the fact that I was unlikely to play the next one. I I'd spoken privately to both family, friends, and of course also my chess team that this was likely going to be the last, the last match. Um, what happened was that 
right before the World Championship match, there was this young player, uh, Alreza Firuja. He had a dramatic rise. He rose to second in the world rankings. He was 18 then, ni- he's 19 now. He qualified for the candidates. And it felt like there was like at least a half realistic possibility that he could be the challenger for the next world championship. Uh, and that sort of lit a fire under me. Um, so you like that idea? Yeah, I, I like that. I like that a lot. I love the idea of of playing him in the next world, world championship. And originally, I just I was sure that I wanted to announce right after the tournament, uh, the match, that this was it. Yeah. I'm done. I'm not playing the next one. But this lit a fire under me, so that made me think. You know, this actually motivates me, and yeah. I just wanted to get it out there for several reasons. To create more hype about the candidates, mm-hmm. to like sort of motivate myself a little bit, may- maybe motivate him. Also, obviously, I wanted to give people and people a heads up for the candidates that you might be playing for more than more than first place. Like normally, yeah. the candidates is is first place or bust. It's like the world yeah. championship. Um, yeah, and and then. So Nakamura was one of ma- many people who just didn't believe me, yeah. which is fair, because I've talked before about not, not necessarily wanting to to defend again, but I never like talked as concretely or was as serious as this time. So he simply didn't believe me, and he was very vocal about that, and he said nobody believed me, no not not the players, which may or may have not have been true, and then yeah, he lost he lost the last game and he didn't didn't qualify. But to answer the question, no, I'd already at that point decided that I wouldn't wouldn't play. I would have liked it less if he had <laughs> if he had not lost the last round. But the decision was but made. the decision was already um was already made. Does it uh does it break your heart a little bit that you're walking away from it? In all the ways that you mentioned that it's just not f- fun, there's a, a, a bunch of ways that it doesn't seem to bring out the best kind of chess. It doesn't bring out the best out of you and the particular opponents involved. Does it just break your heart a little bit? Like you're walking away from something or maybe the entire chess community is walking away from a kind of a, a historic event that was so important in the 20th century, at least. So I won the championship in 2013. I said no to the candidates in 2011. I didn't particularly like the format. I also wasn't, I was just not in the mood. I didn't want the pressure that was connected with the World Championship. And I was perfectly content at the time to play the tournaments that I did play. Um, also to to be ranked number one in the world, I was comfortable with the fact that I knew that I was I was the best, and I didn't need a title to yeah. to show others. Um, and what happened later is, I suddenly decided to play um, in 2013. I liked they changed the format. I, I liked it better. Um, I just decided, you know, it could be interesting. Let's try and get this. Um, there, w- there really wasn't more than <laughs> more than that to it. It wasn't like fulfill fulfilling lifelong dream or anything i just thought you know let's let's play um so it's just a cool tournament a good yeah challenge. It's, it's a cool let's cool play. tournament it's a good challenge you know why not it's it's something that's could be a motivation it motivated me to get in the in the best shape of my life that had been till then so it was a good thing uh and 2013 match brought me a lot of a lot of joy as well so i'm very very happy that i that I did that, but I never had any thoughts that I'm gonna like keep the title for for a long time. Immediately after the match in 2013, I I mean also before the match, I'd spoken against the fact that the champion is seeded into the final, which I thought was unfair. After the match, I made a proposal that we have a different system where the champion doesn't have these privileges and. People's reaction, both players and uh, chess community, was general. Uh, generally, like, okay, we're good. We don't. We don't want that. You keep your privileges. <laughs> and I was like, okay, whatever. So you want to fight for it every time? Yeah, I, I want that. Uh, 
have to ask, just in case you have an opinion, uh, if you can maybe from a fantasy chess perspective, uh, analyze uh, Ding versus Nepo, who wins? The current, the two people that would play if you're not playing. Generally, I would consider that Ding has a slightly better overall chess strength. Um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each, if you can kind of summarize it? Um, so Nepo, he's even better at calculating short lines than I am, um, but he can sometimes lack a little bit of little bit of depth. Uh, like his in short lines is an absolute calculation monster. He's extremely uh, he's extremely quick, but he can sometimes lack a bit of depth. Also, recently um, he's improved his openings quite a bit. So now he um, he has a lot of a lot of good ideas, and he's very very solid. Um, Ding is not quite as well prepared, but he has an excellent understanding of dynamics and imbalances in in chess i would uh i would say what do you mean by imbalances um l- imbalances like bishop bishops against knights and material yeah. imbalances he can take advantage of those yes i would say he's very very good at that and understanding the you know the um, dynamic factors as we call them like material versus time uh especially I think Nepo got the better of him in the candidates. So what's your sense why Ding has an edge in the in the championship? I feel like individual past results hasn't necessarily been a great indicator of world championship results. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like over ch- overall chess strength is more, more important. I, I mean, uh, to be fair, I only think like Ding has a very small edge. Like yes. difference is not big at all. But our individual head-to-head record was probably the main reason that a lot of people thought Nepo had a good chance against me as well. It was like four to one in his favor before the match, but that was just another example of why that may not necessarily mean anything. Also in our case, it was a very, very low sample size. I, th- I think about the size of, of, the, of, of the match in total, 14 games, and that generally doesn't, doesn't mean much. How close were those games, would you say, in your mind for the previous championship? Uh, so th- that game six where it was a turning point where you won, um, was there any doubt in your mind that, you know, like if you do a much larger sample size, that you'll get the better of Nepo? No, no, larger, larger sample size is always good for me. So World Championship, it, it's, it's a great parallel to, to football because it's a low-scoring game. And if the better player or the better team scores they win most of the time oh that's generally for for big for championships or in general yeah for for championships like they generally generally win uh because the other slightly weaker team they're good enough to defend to make it very very difficult for the others but when they actually have to create the chances then they have no chance. And then it very often ends with a blowout as it did in our our match. If I hadn't won game six, it probably would have been very, very close. He might have edged it. There's obviously a bigger chance that I, I would have edged it. But this is just what happens a lot in, in chess, but also in, in, in football that matches are close and then they... Somebody uh, scores. Somebody scores and, and then, then things, things change. And this gives people the illusion that the matchup was very close. Yeah. Which while actually it just means that the nature of the game makes the matches close very often, but it's always much more likely that one of the teams is gonna or one of the players is gonna break away than the others. And in other matches as well, even though a lot of people before the match in 2016 uh, against uh, um against Karyakin, uh, there were People who thought before the match that I was massively overrated as 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 a favorite, and that essentially the match was pretty pretty close, like whatever uh, sixty forty, or some people even said like fifty five forty five. And what I felt was that the match went very very wrong for me, and I still won. Uh, and some people saw that as an indication that the pre match probabilities were probably a bit closer than people thought. Well. 
I would look at it in that in the way that everything went wrong, and I I still I still won, which probably <laughs> means that I was pretty big favorite to begin with. I do have a question to you about that match, but first, so Sergey Karyakin was originally a qualifier for the candidate candidate tournament, but was disqualified for breaching the FIDE code of ethics after publicly expressing approval for the 2022 Russian invasion in Ukraine. When you look at the Cold War and some of the US versus Russian games of the past, does politics, the, the, some of this geopolitics, politics ever creep its way into the game? Do you feel the pressure, the immensity of that, as it does sometimes for the Olympics, you know, these big nations playing each other, competing against each other, almost like fighting out in a, in a friendly way, the battles, the tensions that they have in the space of geopolitics? Yeah, I think it still does. So the president of the World Chess Federation who was just re-elected is, is, is a Russian. Like I like him personally, uh, for sure, uh, but he is quite connected to the Kremlin. Like, And it's quite clear that the Kremlin considers it at least a semi-important goal to bring the chess crown home to to Russia. So it's still it's still definitely a a factor. And I mean I can answer for in the Karyakin case, like I don't have a strong opinion on on whether he should have been banned or not. Obviously I don't agree with anything that he he says. But in principle I think that you should ban either no Russians or all Russians. I'm generally not particularly against either, but I don't love banning wrong opinions, even if they are um, as uh, reprehensible as uh, as his have been. Yeah, there's something about the World Chess Championships or the Olympics where it feels like banning is counterproductive to the alleviating some of the conflicts. We don't know. This is the thing, though. Yeah. We really don't know about the the long-term yeah. conflicts. And a lot of people try to do the right, the right thing in this sense, which I don't really blame at all. It's just that it's just that we don't know. And I guess sometimes it's, there are other ways you want to try and try and help as well. See, like within the competition, within some of those battles of US versus Russia or so on of the past, there's also between the individuals, um, maybe you'll disagree with this, but from a spectator perspective, there's still a camaraderie. Like at the end of the day, there's a thing that unites you, which which is this like appreciation of the fight over the chessboard. It's um, even if you hate each other. Yeah, in no, a moment. For, for sure. I, I think for every every match that's been you would briefly discuss the game with your opponent after after the game no matter how much you hate each other and <laughs> i i think that's lovely uh, and kasparov i mean he was quoted like one somebody in his team asked him like why why are you talking to to karpov after the game like he you hate that guy and he's like yeah sure but he's the only one who understands me <laughs> yeah the only one who understands so that's uh no i think that's really lovely and i, I would love to see that in other in other areas was as well that you can regardless of what happens you can have you can have a good chat about the game you can you can just talk about the ideas with people who who understand what you what you understand so if you're not playing the world championships there's a lot of people who are saying that perhaps the world championships don't matter anymore. Do you think uh, there's some truth to that? I said that back a long time ago as well, that for me, I don't know if it never happened, so I don't know what would have happened, but I was thinking like the moment that I realized that I'm not the best player in the world, like I, I felt like morally I have to renounce the world championship title, you know, because it doesn't mean anything yeah. as long as you're not the best player. So the ratings really tell a, a bigger, a clearer st a story. I think so. At least, at least over time. Like I'm a lot more proud of my streak of being rated number one in the world, which is now since I think the summer of 2011. Uh, I'm a lot more proud of of that than than the world championships. How much? anxiety or, or even fear do you have before making a difficult decision on the chessboard? So when it's a high stakes game, how nervous do you get? 
how much anxiety do you have and all that calculations you're sitting there for 10, 15 minutes because you're in a fog. There's always a possibility of a blunder, of a mistake. Are you anxious about it? Are you afraid of it? Really depends. Um, I have been, I have been at times. I think the most nervous I've ever been was game 10 of uh, the World Championships in 2018. I know that was just a thrilling game. I was black. Um, I basically an- abandoned the queen side at some point to attack him on the king side. And I knew that my attack, if it doesn't work, I'm, I'm going to lose. But I-, I had so much adrenaline. So that was that was fine. I thought I was going to win. Then at some point I realized that it's not so clear. And then my time was ticking and I was just getting so nervous. I, I-, I still remember what happened like we played this time trouble phase where he had very little time but i had even less and i just remember i can't remember much much of it just that when it was over i was just so relieved because then it was clear the position was probably gonna figure out in um in a draw otherwise i'm often nervous before games but when i get there it's all business and especially when i'm playing well I'm never afraid of of losing when I when I play because I trust yeah, I trust my instincts I trust my uh, my skills. How much psychological intimidation is there from you to the other person from the other person to you? I think people would play a lot better if they played against an anonymous me. I would love to or people are scared of you. I, I, w- I would love to to have a tournament online where let's say you play 10 of the best players in the world and you don't, for each round, you don't know who you're playing. Would be, that's an interesting question. You know, like there's these like videos where people eat McDonald's or Burger King or Diet Coke versus Diet Pepsi. Would people be able to tell they're playing you uh, like from the style of play, do you think? Um, Or from the strength of play? If there was a decent sample size, sure. Um, and what about you? Would you be able to tell uh, others in, ter- in, like in just 10? one game? Very unlikely. What what sample size would you need to tell accurately? I feel uh, like it's a science. Ac- yeah, I I think twenty games would help a lot per person. Yeah, but uh, I know that they've already developed AI bots that are pretty good at recognizing somebody's style. Okay, which is um, which is quite fascinating. Uh, <laughs> and it'd be fascinating if those bots were able to summarize the style somehow. Maybe great attacking chess, like some of the same characteristics you've been describing, like great at short, yeah, line calculations, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Or just I mean, talk we shit. Really, <laughs> no, but really, all the best chess players. There are basically just two camps: people who are good at long, longer lines, or or shorter lines, it's the hare and the tortoise, basically. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, I feel like I'm the closest you can get to a, a hybrid of those. Because uh, you got both the, you, you're good in every position, so the middle game and the end game. Yeah, and also I can, I, I can think to some extent both rapidly and deeply, which a lot of people, they cannot do both. Um, but I mean, to, to answer your question from before, I think, yeah, I sometimes can get a little bit intimidated by my opponent, but it's mostly if there's something unknown, if it's mostly if, it, if it's something that I don't understand fully. And I, I do think, especially when I'm playing well, people, they just play more timidly against me than they do against each other. Sometimes without even realizing it. And I certainly use that to my my advantage. If I sense that my opponent is apprehensive, if I sense that they are not gonna necessarily take all their chances, it just means that I can take more risk. And um, I always try and try and find that uh, balance. <laughs> to shake them up a little bit. Yeah. What, what's been the toughest loss of your career that you remember? Would that be the... Um... The world championship match. Oh yeah, for yes. sure. Um, Can you take game, take game eight in 2016? And who was it against? Uh, against Karyakin in in New York. Um, Can you take it through the story of that game? Um, Where were you uh, before that game in terms of game one through seven? 
Yeah, so game one and two, not much happened. Uh, game three and four, I was winning in both of them. And um, normally, I should definitely have converted both. I couldn't, partly due to good defense on, on his part, but mostly because I just, I messed up. Uh, and then after that, games five, six, and seven, not much happened i w- i was getting impatient that at, at that point um so for game 8 i was probably ready to take a little bit more risks than i i had before which i guess was insane because i knew that he couldn't beat me unless i beat myself um <laughs> uh, like he wasn't strong enough to outplay me and he- that was leading to impatience somehow and impatience no, because I knew that I was better. Yeah, I knew that I was better. I knew that I just needed to win one game, and then the match is over. Yeah, that's what happened in in twenty twenty one as well. Like when I won the first game against Nepo, I knew that the match was over. Unless I like fuck up royally, then he's not gonna be able to beat me. So what happened was that I played a kind of an innocuous opening as white, just trying to get a game, trying to get him out of book as soon as possible. Then, okay, can you elaborate? Innocuous, get him out of the book. So, uh, no, but basically, I, I set up pretty defensively as white. I, I wasn't really crossing into his half at the start at all. I was just, I played more like a system more than like a concrete opening. It was like, I'm going to set up my pieces this way. You can set them up however you want. And then later, where sort of the armies are going to meet. I'm, I'm not going to try and bother you at the start. And that means. You can have with as many pieces as possible, kind of pure chess in the middle game, yeah, that's, w- without any of the the lines, the, the, yeah, the ex- standard ex- lines in the exactly, opening. Exactly. Okay. And so there was at some point a couple of exchanges, then some maneuvering, a li- little bit better. Then he was sort of equalizing, and then I started to take too many risks, and I was still sort of fine. Um, but then at some point I realized that. I'd gone a bit too far and I had to be really careful. Then I just froze. I just completely froze. Uh, mentally? like what, Yeah, mentally. What, what I, happened? Do you keep I realized that, I mean, all the thoughts of, I might lose this. What have I done? Why did I take so many risks? I knew that I could have drawn at any moment. Just be patient. Don't give him these opportunities. What triggered that, like, face transition in your mind no it was, was just, one thing or no it was just uh, or... a position on the board like realizing like there was one particular move he played that i missed and then like and then i i realized that this could potentially not go go my way so then i made another couple of mistakes and he to his credit like once he realized he had the chance he was like he knew that this was his one chance he had to take it and so he did and yeah, that's that's the the worst I've ever felt after um, after a chess game. I realized that I'm probably gonna lose my title against somebody who's not even close to my level, and I've done it because of my own stupidity, most of all. Uh, and that was really, really um, at the time. Like I was all in my own head that was that was hard to deal with and i felt like i didn't really recover too much for the next game so what i did there was a free day after the eighth game so i did something that i never did at any other world championship like i after game eight i just i got drunk with my team <laughs> and that's uh, not a standard procedure no no that's that's the only time that's happening um in the world championship during the match so yeah i just tried to forget uh but still before game nine I, game nine i was a little bit more relaxed but i was still a bit nervous then game nine i was almost lost as well and then only game 10 game 10 i was still i wasn't in a great mood i was really really tense um the opening was good uh, i had some advantage i was getting optimistic then i made one mistake he could have forced a draw, and then the old, all the negativity came back. Like I was thinking during the game, like how I'm gonna play for a win with black in the next game. Like what, what, what am I doing? 
Hmm. And then, you know, eventually it ended it ended well. He didn't find the right line. I ground him down. Actually, I played at some point pretty well in the end game. And um after that game, like there was such a weight lifted. Lift, lifted. No, the, I I after that there was like no thought of losing the match whatsoever. I knew that okay, I'd basically gotten away with um not with murder, but getting <laughs> gotten away with something. What can you say about the after game eight? Where are the places you've gone in your mind? Do you go to some, some dark places? We're talking about like depression. Do you think about quitting at that point? No, I mean I I think about quitting every time I lose the classical game, <laughs> <laughs> or I, at least I used to. Yeah, like especially if it's in a stupid way, yeah. I'm thinking like, okay, if I'm gonna gonna play like this if i'm gonna do things that i know are wrong then you know i might as well quit no that's happened that's happened a bunch of bunch of times and i definitely gotten a bit more carefree about losing these days which it's not necessarily a good thing like my hatred of losing led to me not losing a lot and it also lit the fire under me that i think my performance after losses in in classical chess over the last 10 years, it's like over 2,900. Mm -hmm. Like I really play well after a loss, even though it's really, really unpleasant. So apparently like, I don't think the way that I dealt with them is particularly healthy, but it, it's worked. <laughs> it's worked so far. But then you've discovered now a love for winning to where ultimately longevity wise creates more fun. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What's the perfect day in the life of Magnus Carlsen on a day of a big chess match? It doesn't have to be world championship, but if if it's, if it's a chess match you care about, what uh, what time do you wake up? What do you eat? Uh, it depends on when the game is, but let's say the game is at three. Uh, I'll probably wake up uh, pretty late at about 11. Then I'll... Go for go for a walk. Uh, might listen to some podcasts. Maybe I'll spend a little bit of time looking at some, you know, some NBA game from the last night or whatever. So not chess related stuff. No, 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 no. Uh, then I'll I'll get back. I'll have big lunch, like usually, like a big omelet with a bunch of salad and stuff. Then go to the game. Win like a very nice clean game. <laughs> This <laughs> perfect day. Just go back after, relax. Like the the things that make me the the happiest at tournaments is just having a good routine and uh, feeling feeling well. Um, I don't like it when too much is happening around me. So the tournament that I came from now was um, the Chess Olympiad, which is the team event. Mm -hmm. So we were a team Norway. We did horribly. Yeah, uh, I like I did okay, but the team in general did did horribly. Uh, Who and won did, that? Italy? Uh, uh, no, no, Italy beat us, but Uzbekistan won in the end. Yeah. They uh, were this amazing team of young players. It was really, it was really impressive. But the thing is, like, we had a good camaraderie in the team. We had our meals together. We played a bit of football, went swimming, and I couldn't understand why things went wrong, and I still don't understand. But the thing is, for me, it was all very nice. But now I'm so happy to be on my own at a tournament, just to have my own routines, not see too many people. Yeah. Otherwise, just have like a very small team of people that I see. You are a kind of celebrity now. So, you know, people within the chess tournament and outside would recognize you, want to socialize, want to tell you about how much you mean to them, how much you inspire them, all that kind of stuff. Does that get in the way for you when you're like trying to really focus on, on the match? Are you able to uh, block that? Like, are you able to enjoy that those little interactions and still keep your focus? Yeah, uh, most of the time that's uh, that's fine as long as it's not too much. But I have to admit, when I'm at home in Norway, I I rarely go out with like without um, big headphones <laughs> and something. No. Uh, oh, like a disguise? Oh, on my no, not oh, a, just not to a block disguise, out the world. just yeah. to block out the world. Yeah. Otherwise. Um, don't make eye contact. Yeah, just listen to no, no. So the thing is, people in general are nice. I mean, people 
they wish me well uh, and they don't like bother me. Also, when I have the headphones on, I don't notice as much people like turning around and yeah. and all of that. So I can be more of in my own world. Uh, <laughs> so I like that. Yeah. Uh, what about after the, the, in this perfect day, after the game, do you try to analyze what happened? Do you try to think through systematically or do you just kind of loosely think about like, no, I just around? loosely think about it. I, I've never been very structured in, in that sense. Um, I know that it was always recommended that you analyze your, your own games, but I, I generally felt that I mostly had a good idea about that. Like nowadays I will like loosely see what the engine says at, at a certain point if I'm curious about that. Otherwise I usually move on to the next. What about diet? You said omelet and salad and so on. I heard uh, in your conversation with the uh, with the other Magnus, Magnus number two, about your you had like this bet about meat. You one of you gonna go vegan if you lose? I forget which bet. vegetarian though. Oh, vegetarian. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, you both have an admiration for meat. Is there um, is there some aspect about optimal performance that you look for in food like? maybe eating only like once or twice a day or a particular kind of food, like meat heavy diet. Is there anything like that? Or you just try to have fun with the food? Yeah, I think um, whenever I'm at tournaments, like it's very natural to eat, at least for me to eat only twice a day. So usually I do that when I'm at home as well. Before, so you you do eat before the tournament though. You don't, you don't play fasted. No, 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 no. Um, but I try not to eat too heavy before the game or in general to avoid sugary stuff to have a pretty stable uh, blood sugar level because that's the easiest way to make mistake that your your energy levels just suddenly suddenly drop and they don't necessarily mean need to be too high as long as they're pretty stable yeah have you ever tried playing fasted like you know like uh intermittent fasting so oh. playing without having eaten I mean, the reason I ask, you know, uh, I've especially when you do a low carb diet. When I've done a person a low carb diet, I'm able to fast for a long time, like eat once a day, maybe uh, twice a day. But I just the mind is most focused on like really difficult thinking tasks when it's fasted. It's an interesting, and a lot of people kind of talk about that. Yeah, but you're able to kind of like zoom in, and if you're doing a low carb diet, you don't have this energy. The energy stable. No. That is true. Maybe that would be interesting to try. So what's happened for me is I played a few tournaments where I've had food poisoning. <laughs> and then that generally means that you're both sleep deprived and you have no energy. Yeah. And what I've found is that it makes me to some it makes me very calm, of course, because I don't have the energy. And it makes me super creative. Like Interesting. being sleep deprived, I think in general makes you creative. Just the first <laughs> thing that goes away is the ability to do the simple things. That that's that's what if it affects you the most. Like you cannot be precise. So I'm that's the only thing I'm worried about. Like if if I'm fasted, that I w won't be won't be um, precise when I play. But you might be more creative. It's an interesting trick. Fasted, off. yeah, potentially. What about you have been known to, on a rare occasion, play drunk. Is there a mathematical formula for sort of on the x-axis, how many drinks you had, and on the y-axis, your performance slash creativity? Is there like an optimal for, like uh, one of the, th would you suggest for the FIDE World Championship that people would be required to drink? Would that change things in, in <laughs> interesting ways? Yeah, not at all. Um, maybe for Rapid, but for, for Blitz, I think if you're playing blitz, you're mostly playing on on short calculation and intuition, and I think those are probably enhanced if you've had a little bit of little bit to drink. Can you uh, explain the uh, the physiology of why that's why it's enhanced, or the you're just you're thinking less, you're more confident. Oh yeah, it's I think <laughs> I think it's, it's just confidence. I think also like a lot of people feel like they're better at speaking languages, for instance, if they've drunk a little bit. It's just like removing these barriers. Yeah. I think that it's it's a little bit of 
the same in in chess in 2012 i played the world bliss championship and mm -hmm. then i i was doing horribly for for a long time i also had food poisoning there <laughs> i couldn't play at all for for three days so there before the last break i was like in the middle of the pack like in i don't know 20th place or something and so i decided like as the last last gasp i'm gonna go to the mini bar and just have a few drinks and um what happened is that i came back and i was suddenly relaxed hmm. uh, and i was playing fast and i was playing confident and i thought i was playing so well i wasn't playing nearly as well as i thought but it still helped me like i won my remaining eight games and if there had been one more round i probably would have won the whole thing but finally i was I was second. So generally, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> but maybe as a last resort sometimes. Like if yeah. you feel that you have the ability, like obviously none of this is remotely relevant if you don't feel like you have the ability to begin with. But if, yeah. you, like, if you feel like you have the ability, there are just factors that make it impossible for you to, um, to show it, like numbing your mind a bit can probably be a good thing. Yeah, well, it's interesting, especially during training, you have all kinds of sports that have interacted with a lot of athletes in grappling sports. It's different when you train under extreme exhaustion. For example, you start becoming, you start to discover interesting things. You start being more creative. Yeah. A lot of people, uh, in at least in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they'll they'll smoke weed. You know, it does, it creates this kind of anxiety and relaxation that kind of, uh, enables that creative aspect. It's interesting for training. Of course, you can't rely on any one of those things too much, but it, it's cool to throw in like a few drinks every once in a while to, uh, yeah, one, first of all, to relax and have fun, and two, to kind of try things differently, to unlock a different part of your brain. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what about supplements? Do you, uh, are you a coffee guy? Oh, Is no. Um, I quite like the taste of coffee. Mm -hmm. uh i've but, it, but the thing is i've never had a job <laughs> so i've never needed to wake up early yeah so my thought is basically that if i'm tired i'm tired that's fine yeah then i'll you know then i'll, I'll, I'll work it out so i don't want to ever um make my brain get used to get used to coffee like if you see me drinking coffee that's that probably means that I'm massively, massively hungover, and <laughs> I don't. I just yeah. want want to try ever, anything to to make my brain work. Yeah, that's interesting. But for a lot of people, like you said, taste of coffee. For a lot of people, coffee is part of a, a certain kind of ritual. Yeah, for sure. They enjoy, you know. So no, uh, but, I, but you can I, have I, rituals. I, I know that, that I would enjoy it a lot. Yeah. No, just there, you don't no want to rely on it. That. Yeah. No. <laughs> Uh, I also like the taste, so there's no problem there. What about exercise? So, how does that? What like what? What you know? A lot of people talk about the extreme um, stress that chest puts in your body, physically and mentally. How do you prepare for that to be physically, and mentally? Is it just through playing chess, or do you do cardio and you, any of that kind of stuff? This is kind of a bit up and down, like. As I said in 2013, I was in I was in great shape. Like, I mean, generally I was exercising, doing sports every day, either playing football or um, tennis or even other other sports. Otherwise, if I couldn't do that, I would try and take my my bike for for a ride. I had a few training camps and I played tennis against one of my my seconds. Like. He's not a super fit guy, but he's always been very good at tennis. And I never like played in any organized way. Um, and that was like that was a that was the perfect exercise because I was running around enough to make the games pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and it means meant that he had to run a bit less as well. But he was just he said like he he was shocked that if we played like for two hours i wouldn't flinch at all interesting so like a combination of fun and uh the differential between skill 
result in good cardio. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it is, it's just that. Um, so in those days, I was I was pretty uh, I was pretty fit in that sense. I've always liked doing sports, but at times, you know, I, I think in winter especially, like I never had like a schedule. So at times, I let myself go a little bit, uh, and I've always kind of done it more for for fun than like for a concrete benefit but now i'm at least after the uh pandemic i was not in great shape so now i'm trying to to get back get better get better habits and uh and so on but um i feel like i've always been the poster boy for making being fit a big thing in chess and i always felt that it was it's not really deserved because I never liked doing weights much at all. Um, I run a bit at times, but I never liked it too much. You just love playing I sports. I just love playing sports. So yeah. that I think people confuse that because I'm I'm not like massively athletic, but I but I do I I am decent at 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 sports, and that that sort of helped build that that perception. Even though others who are top level chess players. Um, they're more fit, like Karana, for instance. He's really, really, um, his body is really, really strong. It's just that he doesn't. He like goes to the gym and and yeah, just, like, it, it the... doesn't play sports. That's that's the that's the difference. <laughs> and the thing about sports is also is just, uh, it's an escape. It, may, it helps you forget for for a brief moment about like the the obsessions, the pursuits of of the main thing, which is chess. Yeah, for yeah. for uh for sure. And I think it's it also helps your main pursuit to feel that you're um, even if not mastering, but like doing well in something um, in something else. Like I found that if I just juggle a ball, that makes me feel better before a game. <laughs> so a, a skilled like a activity juggler, juggler football yeah yeah skill, skilled activity that you can improve on over time it, fo it like flexes the same kind of muscle but on the thing that you're much worse at yeah uh it, it focuses you relaxes you that's really interesting what uh what's the perfect day in the life of magnus carlson when he's training so like what's a good training regimen in terms of you know daily kind of training that you have to put in across many uh, days, months, and years uh, to just keep yourself sharp in terms of chess? I would say when I'm at home, I do very, very little deliberate practice. I've never been that guy at all. Like I I could never force myself to just sit down and work. So deliberate practice, just so maybe you can educate me, for some grandmasters, what would that look like? Just doing puzzles kind of thing? Or yeah, they... yeah do, doing puzzles and opening analysis. That would be the main things. Studying games? Just studying games, yeah, a little bit. But I feel like that's something that I do. But it's not deliberate. It's like reading an article or reading a book. Got it. Like, I love chess books. I'll read just anything mm -hmm. and I'll find something interesting. So chess books that are uh, like on openings and stuff like that, or chess books that go over different games? Yeah, um, both books on, so there are three main categories. There are books on openings and there are books on strategy and there are books on chess history. And I find all of them very, very interesting. Like what fraction of the day would you say you have a chess board floating somewhere in your head? Meaning like you're thinking about it Probably be a better question to ask how many hours a day I don't have a chess board yeah. floating in my <laughs> I mean, it could be just floating there and nothing is happening, but like- I, I, little... I often do it parallel to some other activity though. And what, what does that look like? Like, are you daydreaming like different, is it actual positions you're just fucking around with, like fumbling with different pieces in your head? Often I've looked at a at the random game on, on my phone, for instance, or in, in a book, and then my brain just keeps going at the same position, analyzing it, and often it goes all the way, you know, to the end game. And those are actual games, or you conjure up like fake games? No, they're often based on real games, uh, and then I'm I'm thinking like, oh, but it wouldn't be more interesting if the pieces were a little bit different, and then often I play it out from there. So you don't have a. Like you don't sit behind a computer or a chessboard 
and you lay out the pieces and no, then you're I'm not at all a poster boy for deliberate practice. I could never I could never work that way. My first coach, he gave me some exercises to do at home sometimes, but he realized at some point uh, <laughs> that wasn't gonna work. Yeah. <laughs> because I wouldn't do it really or enjoy it. So what he would do instead is that at the school where I had the trainings with him, there was this massive chess library. So he was just like, yeah, pick pick up books. You can have anything. You can have anything you want. Uh, just pick up books you like, and then you give back the next time. So that's, so that's what I did it. instead. Yeah, I just absolutely rated the. <laughs> and then my next tournament, I will try out one of the openings from that book if it was an opening book and so on. So I, does it feel like a struggle, like challenging, like to to be thinking those positions, or is it fun and relaxing? No, it's completely fine. I don't like if it's a difficult position to figure out. You know, like to calculate. And then I go on to something else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like if I can't figure it out, then. You know, I go on. <laughs> Change it so that it's easier to figure out. There was a point in your life where Kasparov was interested in being your coach or tra at least training with you. Why Why did you choose not to go with him? That's a pretty bold move. <laughs> was there a good reason for this? No. Um, the first like home exercise he gave me was to analyze. Like He picked out, I think, three or four of my worst losses, and he wanted me to, to analyze them and give him my thoughts and it wasn't that there were painful losses or anything that that was a problem i just didn't really enjoy that also i felt that this whole structured approach and everything yes yeah, I, I just felt like from the start it was a was a hassle so i loved the idea of being able to pick his brain but everything else i just you know, couldn't see myself, couldn't see myself enjoying. And at the end of the day, I did then and always have played for fun. That's always been like the well, main reason. So it's great that you had the confidence to sort of basically turn down the approach of one of the greatest chess players of all time. At that time, probably the greatest chess player of all time. I, like, I don't think I thought of it that way. I just thought this is not for me. I want to try another way. I don't think I was particularly thinking that this is my one opportunity or anything. It was just, yeah, I don't enjoy this. Let's try something else. <laughs> when you were 13, you faced Kasparov uh, and he wasn't able to beat you. Can you go through that match? What did that feel like? How important was that? Was that, how epic was that? We played three games. Uh, I lost two and I drew one. Right, the, but one draw. Uh, yes, no, the one yes. draw. Um, and but did, didn't you say that you kind of had a better position in that? Yeah, I remember that day very well. There was a blitz game. This was a rapid tournament, and there was a blitz tournament the day before, which determined the uh, the pairings for the rapids. Mm -hmm. um, and for people who don't know, super short games are called bullet. Kind of short games are called blitz. Semi short games are called rapid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and classic chess, I guess, is like yeah. very super long. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, bullet is never played over the board. So in terms of over the board chess, blitz is the shortest. Rapid is like a hybrid between classical and blitz. You need to have the skills of both, and then classical is, is long. The blitz tournament, which didn't go so well. Uh, like, I got a couple of wins, but I was beaten badly in a lot of games, including by Gary. Mm -hmm. And so the, there was the pairing that I had to play him, which was pretty exciting. So I remember I was so tired after the Blitz tournament, like I slept for 12 hours or something. Then I woke up like, okay, I'll turn on my computer. I'll search chess space for Kasparov and we'll go from there. <laughs> <laughs> so before that, I hadn't spent like a lot of time specifically studying his games. And it was super intimidating because a lot of these openings I knew. I was like, oh, he was the first one to play that. Oh, that was his idea. I actually didn't know that. So I was a bit intimidated before we played. Then, of course, the first game, uh, he... Um, arrived a bit late because they changed the time from the first day to the other, which is a bit strange. And but everybody else had noticed it, but him, um, 
then he tried to surprise me in the opening. I th- I think like psychologically uh, the situation was not so easy for him. Like clearly it would be embarrassing for him if he didn't win both games against me. Then like I was spending way too much time on my moves because I was playing Kasparov. I was double checking everything too much. Like normally I would would be playing pretty fast in those days. And then at some point I calculated better than him he missed a crucial detail and had a much better position i couldn't convert it though i knew what line i had to go for uh in order to have a chance to win but i thought like i'll play a bit more carefully maybe i can win still i couldn't and uh, then i lost the second game pretty badly which it wasn't majorly upsetting but I felt that I had two black games against Kasparov, both in the Blitz and the Rapid, and I lost both of them without any fight whatsoever. I wasn't happy about that at all. That was like less than I, I thought I could be able to to do. So f- to me, yeah, I was proud of that, but it was a gimmick. I was like a very strong IM, but had GM strength. I was like, it can happen that a player of that strength makes a, a draw against Gary once in yeah, a while. Yeah, but okay, for people But, but I mean I mean, I understand that I'm I'm 13 but like still I felt a bit more gimmicky than anything. I mean, I guess it's it's a good thing that made me noticed. Uh but apart from that, yeah. it wasn't, yeah. You know. And for people who don't know, I am as international master and uh, GM as grandmaster and you were just on the, I guess on the verge of becoming a, yeah. a young youngest grandmaster ever. I was the second youngest ever yeah. i think i'm like the seventh youngest now i mean these kids these days are... kids these days yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no okay. but I, uh <laughs> but i was the youngest grandmaster at the, at the time uh at the time, in, right. in the world yeah yeah so there is a you know you say it's gimmicky but there's a romantic notion is the especially as things have turned out right like no for sure and have you talked to gary at, since then about that no, not really. I, I I think he's embarrassed about. He's that. still bitter. You think? <laughs> no, I don't think he's he's bitter. But I I think the game in itself was was a bit embarrassing for him. Uh, so, so even he can't see past like is no no, like, no no. I think he's completely fine with that. I think like in retrospect, it's a good story. He appreciates he appreciates that. I don't think that's the problem. But it never made sense for me to broach the subject with him. Yeah, I I just I. It's funny just having interacted with Gary, now having talked to you, there is a, a little thing you still hate losing. No matter how beautiful like that moment is, because it's like, it, in in a way it's a passing of the baton from like one great champion to another, Yeah. right? But like you, you still just don't like the fact that you didn't play a good game from a Gary, Gary's perspective. Like he's still just annoyed probably that yeah. <laughs> he could have played better. And we did, so we did work together in 2009 quite a lot and that corporation ended um early 2010 but we did play a lot of training games in 2009 which was interesting because he was still very very strong and at that time it was fairly equal like he was at playing me quite a bit but I was I was fighting well so it was it was pretty um pretty even then um so i i mean i appreciate those games a lot more than some random game from when i was 13 and i maybe i just don't know what i'm talking about but i've always found it at least based on that game you couldn't tell that i was gonna take his (laughs) uh, that i was gonna take his spot like i made a horrible blunder and lost to an uzbek kid in the, the world rapid championship and in 2018. Uh, mm-hmm. And I mean, granted, he was part of the team that now won gold in the Chess Olympia, but he wasn't the crucial part. He barely played any games. Like, it wasn't like I would think that he would become world champion because he beat me. I'm always skeptical of yeah. those who said that they knew that I was going to be world champion after uh, after that game or at all at that time. I mean, it was easy to see that I would become a very, very strong player. Uh, everybody could see that, but to be the best in the world or one of the best ever. It's true. That's it, it, hard it's, to say. It's, it is hard to say, but I do remember seeing Messi when he was 16 and 17. Uh, but hasn't that happened with other players though? Yeah, but I I, pers- I just had a personal experience. He did look different than, there's like magic there. 
you, maybe you can't tell he would be uh one of the greatest ever, but there's there's still magic. But you're right. Most no. of the time, we try to project. We see a young kid being an older person, and you start to think, okay, this could be the next great person. And then we forget when they don't become that. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. I think what happens. <laughs> but when it does uh, maybe, become, maybe, uh, or maybe some people are just so good at seeing these patterns that they can actually see. Aren't you supposed to do that kind of thing with fantasy football? Like see the long shot and bet on them and then they turn out to be good? That's, no, that's you, you make a lot of lot of long shot bets and then some of them come good. <laughs> and then people call you a genius for making yeah. the bet. Well, let me ask you the GOAT question, again, from fantasy perspective. Can you make the case for the greatest chess player of all time for each, yourself, Magnus Carlsen, for Garrett Kasparov, I don't know who else, Bobby Fischer, Mikhail Tal, anyone else? Um, for uh, Hikaru Nakamura, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think I'll, I can make a case for uh, myself, for for Gary and for Fischer. So I'll start with Fischer. Uh, for him, it's very, very simple. He was ahead of his time, but that's like intangible. You can say that about a lot of people. But he had a peak from 1970 to 72, when he was so much better than the others. He won 20 games in a row. Also, the way that he played was so powerful and with so few mistakes that he just had no opposition there. So he had just a peak that's been better than anybody. Like The gap between the first gap and between second him was and the others have, have, was greater than it's ever been in history at any other time. Uh, and that would be the argument for for him. For Gary, he's played in a very competitive era and he's beaten several generations. He was the best. Well, he was the consensus best player, I would say for almost 20 years, which yeah. nobody else has, has done in at least in recent time. And so the uh, longevity. That the longevity for sure. Also at his peak, he um was not quite the level of um of Fisher in terms of the gap, but it was similar to or I think even a little bit better than than mine. As for me, I'm of course unbeaten as as a world champion in in five tries i've been world number one for 11 years straight in an even more competitive era than gary i have the highest chess rating of all time i have the longest streak ever without losing a game i think for me the main argument would be about the era where there's the um, engines have leveled the um, playing field so much that it's it's harder to dominate and still i haven't always been a clear number one but i've always i've been number one for 11 years and for a lot of the time the gap has been pretty big so i think there are decent arguments for for all of them um i've said before and i haven't changed my mind that gary generally edges it because of the longevity in in the competitive era but um there are arguments but people also talk about you in terms of the style of play. So it's not just about dominance or the height or the, it's like just the, the creative genius of it. Uh, yeah, but I'm not interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, greatest of all time, uh, I'm not interested in, in, in questions of style. So, so for Messi, you don't give credit for the style. Uh, for the stylistic, games. I like. I like. Um, no, I like watching it. I just. But you're not gonna give points for the. So Messi. No, gets I mean best the, the, ever the, because of the finishing. Yeah, uh, it's it's the um the f no, it's not because of the finishing. It's because of his overall impact on the game is higher than anybody else's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he <right>. contributes. <laughs> he can just contributes more to winning than anybody else does. What's um, so you, you're somebody who was advocated for and has done quite a bit of study of classic games. What would you say is, um, I mean, maybe the number one or maybe top three games of chess ever played? It doesn't interest me at all. You don't think of those? No, I don't think of it. I, I mean, I try to 
I find the games interesting. I try to learn from them, but like trying to to rank them has never interested me. What 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 games pop out to you as like super interesting? Then is there is there things like where idea like old school games where there was like interesting ideas that uh, um, that you go back or like you you find surprising and pretty cool that 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 those ideas were developed like then. Is um, there something that jumps to mind? Yeah, there are several games of young Kasparov, like before he became world champion. If you're going to ask for like my favorite player or favorite style, that's probably... Young Kasparov. Young Kasparov. Can you describe stylistically or in any other way what, what young Kasparov was like that you are that you like? Uh, it was just an overflow of energy in his play. So aggressive. Yeah, attacking extre- extremely aggressive, dynamic chess. It probably appeals to me a lot because these are the things that I cannot do as well. Uh, that it just feels very special to me. But yeah, in terms of games, I never never thought about that too much. Is there uh, memories, big or small, weird, surprising, uh, just any kind of beautiful anecdote um, from your chess career? Like stuff that pops out that people might not know about. Just stuff when you look back, it just makes you smile. No, so I'll tell you about the um, most satisfying tournament victory of my career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that was the Norwegian Championship Under 11 in 2000. Before that tournament, I was super anxious because I started like kind of late at chess. I, I played my first tournament when I was eight and a half, and a lot of my competitors had already played for for a couple of years or even three, four years at that point. And the first time, I so I played the Under-11 Championship in 99. I was like a little over the middle of the pack. I'd, I'd never played against any of them before, so I didn't know what to expect at all. And then over the next year, I was just like edging a little bit closer. In each tournament, I felt like I was getting a little bit better. And when we had the championship, I knew that I was ready, that I was now at the same level of the best players. I was so anxious to to show it. I remember I was just, the feeling of excitement and nervousness before the tournament was incredible. The tournament was weird because I started out, I gave away a draw to a weaker player whom I shouldn't have drawn to. And then, I drew against the other guy who was clearly like the best or second best. And uh, and at that point I thought it was over because I thought he wouldn't he wouldn't give away points to others. And then the very next day he lost to somebody. So the the rest of the tournament it was just like I was always like playing my game and watching his. And we both won the rest of our games, but it meant that I was half a point ahead. Like the feeling when I realized that I was going to win, um, that was just so amazing. It was like the first time that I was the best at my age. And at that point... You were hooked. Yeah, at that point I realized, you know, this I could actually be very good at this. So you, you, you kind of saw, where did you think your ceiling would be? Did you see that? Did you, th- did you see that one day you could be the number one? No, I didn't. Person? I didn't think that was possible at all. Um, but when did you first? I thought I could be the best in Norway. The best in Norway at that point. When did be- you be- first? Because like I started relatively late, right? So, I, yeah. And also like I knew that I studied a lot more than the others. I knew that I had a passion that they didn't have. They saw chess as something like it was you know it was a hobby it was like an activity it was like um it was like going to to football practice or any other sports like you go you practice like once or twice a week and then you play a tournament at the weekend that's that's what you did for me it wasn't like that like i would go with my books and my board every day after school uh and i wouldn't I would just constantly be trying to learn new things. I had like two hours of internet time on the computer each week. <laughs> and I would always spend them on on chess. <laughs> like, um, yeah. I think 
before I was 13 or 14, I'd never opened a browser for any other reason than to play chess. Would you describe that as love or as obsession or something in between? It's everything? Yeah, everything. Yeah. What, uh, but it, 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 so, I mean, it wasn't hard for me to tell at that point that I had something that the other other kids didn't because I was never the, the one to grasp something very, very quickly. But once I started, I always got hooked and then I never stopped learning. What would you say, you've talked about the middle game as a, as a place where you can play pure chess. What do you think is beautiful to you about chess? Like the thing when you were 11. What is beautiful to me is when your opponent can predict every single one of your moves and they still lose. <laughs> How does that happen? No, like it means that at some point early, your planning, your evaluation has been better. So that you play just very simply, very clearly. It looks like you did nothing special and your opponent lost without a chance. So you're, how do you think about that, by the way? Are you basically narrowing down this gigantic tree of options to where your opponent has less and less and less options to win, to escape, and then they're trapped? Yeah, that's it. essentially. Is there some aspect to the patterns themselves, to the positions, to the elegance of like, the the dynamics of the game that you just find beautiful that 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 doesn't that where you forget about the opponent I, in general i try and create harmony on the board like what i would usually find harmonious is that the pieces work together that they protect each other uh and that there are no pieces that are suboptimally placed or uh, if they are suboptimally placed, they can be improved pretty easily. Like, I hate when I have one piece that I know is badly placed and I cannot improve it. When, when Yeah, when you're thinking about the, the harmony of the pieces, when you're looking at the position, you're evaluating it. Are you looking at, at the whole board? Or is it like a bunch of groupings of pieces overlapping? I would and like dancing together kind of thing. I would say it's more of the latter. That would be more uh, precise that you look. I mean, I look mostly closer to the middle, but then I would focus on one, like there are usually like one grouping of pieces on one side and then some more closer to the the other side. So I would, um, I would think of it a little bit that way. So, and everything is kind of gravitating to the middle. If it's going well, then yes. <laughs> and in harmony. Yeah, in, in, in harmony. Or, like if you can control the middle, you can more easily attack on both sides. That applies to pretty much any game. It's as simple as that. And like attacking on one side without control of the middle would feel very non-harmonious for, for me. Like I, I talked about the 10th game and in the world championship like that's the time i was the most nervous and it was because it was a kind of attack that i hate where you just have to you're abandoned one side and you the attack has to work there was one side and part of the middle as well which i didn't control at all and that that's like the opposite of harmony for me what advice would you give to chess players of different levels, how to improve in chess. Very beginner, complete beginner. I mean, at every level. Is there is there something you can... It's very hard, very hard for me to say. Because, I mean, the easiest way is like, love chess, be obsessed. Well, that's a really important statement. <laughs> but that doesn't work for everybody. So Sometimes I feel like... It can feel like a grind. So you're saying if it, the less it can feel like a grind, the better, the better. Yeah, for sure. At least for you. That's for sure, but I'm also very, very skeptical ab about giving advice because I think, again, my w way only works if you have some combination of talent and, and obsession. So I'm not sure that I'd generally recommend it. Like what I've done doesn't go with what most coaches suggest for their kids. 
I've been lucky that I've had coaches from from early on that have been very very hands off and just allowed me to do my thing basically. Well, there's a lot to be said about uh, cultivating the obsession, like really, yeah, really letting that flourish to where you spend a lot of hours like with the chessboard in your head and it doesn't feel like a struggle. No. So like just letting me do my thing. Like if you give me a bunch of work, it will probably feel like a chore. And if you don't give me, I will spend all of that time on my own without thinking that it's it's work or without thought that I'm doing this to improve my chess. Well, in terms of learning stuff like books, there's a, a, one thing that's relatively novel from your perspective, people are starting now is there's YouTube. There's a lot of good YouTubers. You're a part-time YouTuber. You have, you have stuff on YouTube, I guess. Yeah, yeah but I, I mean, <laughs> if you've seen my YouTube, it's mostly like- It's very- <laughs> It's uh, it's not- It's carefree. Generally not high effort content. <laughs> yeah, uh, but do you like any particular YouTubers? Um, I, I could just recommend like stuff I've seen. So I get the Gotham Chess, Botez Live. Yeah. Um, I really like uh, St. Louis Chess Club, uh, Daniel Naroditsky and uh, John Bartholomew. Those are good channels, but is there something you can recommend? No, all of them are good. You know, the best recommendation I could give is uh, Agon Mater. Um, purely- How much did he pay you to say that? No, so the thing <laughs> about that is that I haven't really, I have, so I can tell you I've never watched any of his videos from from start to finish yeah i'm not like i'm I'm not the target audience obviously yeah. but i think the only chess youtube video that my dad has ever watched from start to finish is agamato and he said like i watched one of his videos i wanted to know what it, what it was all about because i think agamato is like the same strength as my father, or maybe just a little bit weaker, like 1900 or something. My father is probably about 2000. And my father has played chess his whole life. Uh, he loves, he absolutely loves the game. It was like, that's the only time he's actually sat through one of those videos. And he said like, yeah, I get it. I enjoy it. So that's the best recommendation <laughs> I, I, could, I could give. That's the only channel that my father actually enjoys. <laughs> this is hilarious. I talked I talked to him before this to ask him if he has any questions for you. And uh he said, No, you just just do your thing, you know. What no, you're he's doing. he's so careful. He wouldn't uh, do that. He did mention jokingly about uh Evan's Gambit, I think. Is that a thing? Evan's Gambit? It's some weird thing he made up. It might be an inside joke. I don't I don't know, but he asked me to. Well, anyway. The, I yeah, I didn't even get the, um It's some yeah, thing he made up. I, maybe, I, didn't even realize that he plays the Evans Gambit. Like he plays a lot of gambits that are. Wait, Evans Gambit is a thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a thing. Okay. Like that's an old opening from the 1800s. Uh, Captain Evans uh, apparently in invented it. Why would he mention that particular one? Yeah, there's something hilarious about know. that one. I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't think I've ever faced the Evans Gambit in a in a game. I feel I, like both I, of you are trolling trolling me right now. <laughs> but I mean, he's so he's played a lot of other gambits. <laughs> maybe this is the one he wanted to uh, to mention. So this, maybe this is called the Evans Gambit as well. But I just know it as like the two two G four Gambit. Maybe this is the one. Like this one, he has. This one he has played a bunch. Uh, and he, <laughs> and he 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 he's been telling me a lot about his games in this line. It's like, oh, it's not so bad. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but you're pawn down. Yeah, uh, but I can I can sort of see it. I can sort of um, I can sort of understand it. And he's like, he's proud of the fact that nobody like told him to play this line or anything. He came yeah. up with it well, himself. And there's this. Uh, I'll tell you another story about my father. So there there's this line that I call that I call the Henry Carlson line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What's the line? Um, so at some point, you know, he never knew a lot of openings in in chess, but I taught him. I taught him a couple of openings as black. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the uh, it's the Sveshnikov Sicilian that I've played a lot myself. Also, um, during the um, the World Championship in 2018, I won a bunch of games in 2019 as well. So that's one opening. And I also taught him as black to play the Ragosin defense. Um, and then, so the Ragosin defense goes like goes like this. 
um, it's characterized by um, by this bishop move. Um, and so uh, he would play those openings pretty pr pretty exclusively and as black in the tournaments that he did play. And also the Sveshnikov Sicilian is like, that's the only two of my sisters play have played a bunch of chess, chess tour tournaments as well. And that's the only opening they know as well. So my my family's repertoire is very narrow. <laughs> so so this is the this is the system. Black goes here, and then very often white takes the pawn, and black takes the pawn. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point, I was watching one of my my father's online blitz game, blitz game, and as white he played this, this. Uh, so this is called the Karakhan defense. He took the pawn. Mm -hmm. um, was taken back, then he went with the knight. Mm -hmm. um, his opponent went here, and then he played the bishop here. So I, I'd never seen this opening before, and I was like, "Wow, um, <laughs> how on earth did he come up with that?" And he said, "No, I just played the Ragosin with the different colors because if the knight was here, it would be the same position." I was like, "I never." I was like, "How how am I like?" one of the best <laughs> 20 players in the world. I've, and I've never thought about that. Yeah. So I actually started playing, I started playing this line uh, as white with pretty decent results. And it results and it actually became kind of popular. And everybody uh, who asked about the line, it's like, I would always tell them, yeah, that's the Henry Carlson variation. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily explain why it was called that. I would just always call it that. So I really hope at this point, at some point, this line will be uh, will find its its rightful name in the uh, yeah it fi finds its ways into the history books. Yeah. Can you uh, what 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 did you learn about life from your dad? What what role has your dad played in your life? He's taught me a, a lot of things, uh, but most of all, as long as you win a chess, then everything else is fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my especially my father but my parents in general they they always wanted me to get a good ed education and um find a job and so on um even though my father loves chess and he wanted me to to play chess i don't think he had any plans for me to be professional uh, i think s things changed at some point like i was less and less interested in school and for a long time we were kind of going back and forth, fighting about that, um, especially my father, but also my mother a little bit. It was at times a little bit difficult. They wanted you to go to school. So yeah, they, they, they sort of wanted me to do more school, to, to have more options. And then I, I think at some point, uh, they just gave up. <laughs> but I think that sort of coincided when I was actually starting to make real money off tournaments. And after that, you know, everything's been sort of easy and like in terms of the family like they've never put any pressure on me or they've never put any demands on me um there's just yeah mine just has to focus on chess that's <laughs> that that's um that's it like i i think they taught me in general to be curious about the world and to get a decent general education not necessarily from from school but like just knowing um, about the world around you and knowing history and being, you know, just being interested in society. Uh, I think in that sense, they've done well. And he's been with you throughout your chess career. I mean, there's something to be said about just family support and love that you have that, that you know, this world is a lonely place. <laughs> it's good to have people around you that are like, yeah, um, um, they got your back, kind of, you know. Yeah, uh, it's a cliche, but I think to some extent, all the people you surround yourself with, they can help you a lot. It's only family that only has their own interests at heart, and so for that reason, like my father is like the only one that's been like constantly in the team that and that he's always been around and it's it's for that reason that i know he has my back no matter what now there's a cliche question here but let, let's try to actually get to some deep truth perhaps 
But people who don't know much about chess seem to like to use chess as a metaphor for everything in life. But there is some aspect to the decision-making, to the kind of reasoning involved in chess that's transferable to other things. Can you, can you speak to that in your, in your own life and in general, the kind of reasoning involved with chess, how much of that does that transfer to life out there? It, it just helps you make decisions. I mean, uh, of all of all kinds. Yeah, that would be my main takeaway. That you learn to make informed guesses in a limited amount of time. I mean, does it frustrate you when you know they have, you have uh, geopolitical thinkers and leaders? You know, Henry Kissinger will often talk about geopolitics as a game of chess or three D chess. Is that a too oversimplified of a projection, or? Or do you think that the kind of deliberations you have on the world stage is, is similar to the kind of decision-making you have on the chessboard? Well, I never, I'm never trying to get reelected when I play a game of chess. <laughs> 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 There's no special interest you have to get happy. Yeah, that kind of, no, that kind of helps. Uh, no, I can, I can understand that. Obviously for every action, there's a reaction and you have to, to calculate far ahead it probably would be a good thing if more big players on the international scene thought a, a little bit more like like a chess player in that sense like trying to make good decision based on um, based on limited amount of data rather than thinking about other um, other factors but it's so tough uh, but it does annoy me when when people make moves that they know are wrong for different reasons and they should know if they did some calculation they should know they're wrong yeah they, exactly yeah. that they should know that are wrong and so much politics is like it's um you're you're often asked to do something when you're when it would be much better to do nothing uh <laughs> like yeah. no but that happens in chess all the time like you have you have a choice like i often tell people that in certain situations, you should not try and win. You should just let your opponent lose. Yeah. And that happens in politics all the time. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, just let your opponents continue whatever they're doing and then you'll win. Don't try to do something just to do something. Often they say in chess that having a bad plan is better than having no plan. It's absolute nonsense. <laughs> I forget what general said it, but uh, it was like, uh, "Don't interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake." Yeah, I think. They're, they're... Also, um, Petrosian, um, the the former world champion, said, um, "When your opponent wants to play the Dutch defense, don't stop them." I mean, chess players will know that it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, this reminds me. Uh, is there something you found really impressive about Queen's Gambit, the TV show? You know, that's one of the things that really captivated the public imagination about chess. People who don't play chess were, became very curious about the game, about the beauty of the game, the drama of the game, all that kind of stuff. Is there, in terms of accuracy, in terms of the actual games played that you found impressive? First of all, they did the chess, they did the chess well, they did it accurately. And also, they found actual games and positions that I never never seen before, which really captivated me. Like I would, I would not follow the um, the story at times. I was just trying to, wow, where the hell did I find that game? And <laughs> just trying to solve the positions. So Beth Harmon, the uh, the the main character, were you impressed by the play she was doing in in the like? Was there a particular style that they developed? No, but she was just at the end she was just totally universal like at the start she was probably a bit too too aggressive but no she was absolutely universal you Uni wait what's what word are you, what adjective are you using <laughs> universal in the sense that she could play a, in any any style oh interesting and and was dominant in that way so wow they, so there was a development in the style too throughout the show yeah for sure it's really interesting they did they did that yeah and uh, it actually happened with me a bit as well. Like I started out really aggressive. Then I became probably too technical at some point, uh, taking a little bit too few risks and not playing dynamic enough. And then I started to get a little bit 
better at dynamics so that now I'm I would say definitely the most universal player in terms of um, in terms of style. Are there any skills in chess that are transferable to poker? So as you're playing around with poker a little bit now, how fundamentally different of a game is it? What I find the most transferable probably is not like letting past decisions dictate future thinking. Yeah. But in terms of the patterns in the betting strategies and all that kind of stuff, uh, what about bluffing? Do you, cause you I bluff way too much. <laughs> It does seem you enjoy bluffing, and uh, Daniel Negrano was saying yeah, that you're quite a, good at it. Uh, but it, yeah, it has very little material to go by. <laughs> Sample size is small. Yeah. No, I mean, I enjoy bluffing for um, the more the gambling aspects, the, the thrill of... So not the technical aspect of the bluffing like you would on the chessboard? Not bluffing in the same sense, but there there is some element... Um, but I do enjoy it on, on, on the chessboard. Like if I um, know that like, oh, I successfully scared away my opponent from making the best move, that's of course satisfying. In that same way, it might be satisfying in poker, right? That you represent something, you scare away your opponent yeah. in the same kind of like, way. Yeah, and also like you tell a story, you try and tell a story and then they believe it. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell a story with your betting, with your... Um, all the d different other cues. Yeah. Do you like the money aspect, the the betting strategies? So it's like it's like it's almost like another layer on top of it, right? Like it's it's the uncertainty in the cards, but the betting. Like, there's so much freedom to the betting. I'm not very good at that, so I cannot say that I understand it uh, completely. You know, when it, it, when it comes to different sizing and. Well, another last. I just haven't studied it enough. How much of luck is part of poker? Would you say from what what you've seen versus skill? I mean, it's so different in the sense that you can be one of the best players in the world and lose two or three years in a row without that being being like a massive outlier. Okay, the 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 thing that more than one person told me that you're very good at is trash talking. <laughs> I don't think I am. A lot of people who make those observations about me, I think they just expect very, very little. So they expect from the best chess player in the world yeah. that just anything that's non-robotic is interesting. Also, when it comes to trash talking, like I have the biggest advantage in the world that I'm the best at what I'm doing. So trash talking becomes very, very, very easy because I can back it up. Yeah. Yeah, but... A lot of people that are extremely good at stuff don't trash talk and they're not good at it. <laughs> I don't think I'm very good at it. It's just that I can back it up, which makes it seem that I'm I'm better. And also- You're even doing it now. My, also <laughs> being non-robotic or not completely robotic helps. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you're not trash talking, you're just stating facts. That's right. Have you ever, have you ever considered that uh, there would be trash talking and, uh, over the chessboard and some of the big tournaments? like adding that kind of component or even talking, you know, mm. would that, would that completely distract from the game of chess? No, I th think it could be um, funny. And when people play offhand games, when they play blitz games, like people trash talk all the time. It's a normal part of the game. So you, uh, you emphasize fun a lot. Uh, do you think we're living inside of a simulation that is trying to maximize fun? But that's only happened for the last, you know, hundred years or so. No, that's well, like the fun has always been in increasing. I think. Yeah. Okay. It's always been increasing, but I feel like it's been increasing exponentially. Yeah. The, the, the I mean the or at least the importance of fun, but I, I guess it depends on the society as well. Like in the West, we've had such uh, Christian influence and. I mean, Christianity hasn't exactly embraced the concept of fun over <laughs> over time. So, well, actually, to push back, I think forbidding certain things kind of makes them more fun. So, so sometimes I think you need to mm -hmm. say you're not allowed to do this, and then then a lot of people start doing it, and then they have fun doing that because it, it's like a um, it's doing a thing in the face of the resistance of the thing. So when, whenever there's resistance, that does somehow make it more fun. Oppressive regimes has always kind of been a 
been kind of good for comedy, no? <laughs> like in, yeah. no, but I, I heard yes. Supposedly, like in the Soviet Union, I don't yeah. know about fun, but yeah. uh, supposedly comedy, like at least underground, it's it thrived. Yeah, there's a well, no, it it permeates the entire culture. There's a dark humor, yeah, that uh, sort of the cruelty, the absurdity of life, really, really brings out the humor amongst the populace. Plus vodka on top of that. <laughs> but this idea that this, for example, Elon Musk has that. Um, the most entertaining outcome is the most likely. That it seems like the most absurd, oh. silly, funny thing seems to be the thing that. <laughs> so it it happens more often than um, than it should, and That's it somehow becomes saying. viral in our modern connected world, and so the fun stuff, the memes, spread, and then we start to optimize for the for the fun meme, that seems to be a fundamental property of of the reality we live in. And so emerges the ma the fun maximizer in all walks of life, like in chess, in 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 poker, in everything. I think you're you're skeptical. No, I'm not skeptical. Uh, I'm just I'm just taking it all in. Uh, but I find <laughs> I find it interesting and not at all impossible. Do you ever get lonely? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, like a chess player's life is by definition, pretty lonely. Um, because you have nobody else to blame but yourself when you lose, or you don't achieve the results that you want to achieve. So it's difficult for you to find comfort elsewhere. It's it's in your own mind. Yeah. It's you versus yourself, really. Yeah, really. But it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's part of the profession. But I think any, like, sport or activity where it's, where it's just you and your own mind is just by definition lonely. Are you worried that it destroys you? Oh, not at all. As long as I'm aware of it, then it's fine. And uh, I don't think the inherent loneliness of my profession really uh, affects the rest of my life in, in a major way. What uh, role does love play in the human condition and in your lonely life? of calculation <laughs> you know i'm like everybody else uh <laughs> trying uh you know trying to find love no not necessarily like trying to find love so sometimes i am sometimes i'm i'm not i'm just trying to find my way yeah and my love for for the game obviously it comes and goes a little bit but there's like there's always at least some level of love so that doesn't doesn't go away but i think in other parts of life i think it's just about doing things that make you happy that give you joy that that also makes you more receptive to to love in general so that that has been my approach to to love now for quite a while that i'm just trying to live my best life and then uh, the love will um, will come uh, when it when it comes, and in in terms of romantic love, it has come and gone in my life. It's not there <laughs> now, uh, but I'm not worried about that. I'm more worried about you know not worried, but more like trying to just be a good version of um, of myself. I cannot always be the best version of myself, but at least try to be good. Yeah, and keep your heart open. What is this uh, uh, Daniel Johnston song? True love will find you in the end. But no, it may or may not. It, but, but, but but it will only find you if uh oh fuck how does it go? If you're looking, so like you have to be open to it. Yeah, it may or may not. Yeah, yeah, and no matter what, you're gonna lose it in the end because it all ends. The whole thing ends. Yeah, yeah. So that's I I don't think stressing over that like obviously. It's so human that you can't help it to some degree. But I feel like stressing over love, that's the blueprint for whether whether you're looking or you're not looking or you're in a relationship or married or anything. Like stressing over it is like the blue blueprint for being unhappy. Uh, just to clarify a confusion I have, uh, just a quick question. How does the night move? <laughs> so the night moves in an L, um, and uh, unlike in shogi, it can move both forwards and backwards. 
It is quite a nimble piece. It can jump over everything, but it's less happy in open position where it has to move from, from side to side quickly. I am generally more of a bishop's guy myself for the old debate. I just prefer quality over the intangibles, but uh, I can appreciate a good night once in a while. Well, last simple question. What's the meaning of life? Magnus Carlsen. There is obviously no meaning to life. Is that obvious? I think we're here by accident. There's no meaning. It ends at some point. Yeah. But it's still a great thing. So yeah. um, you can still have fun even if there's no meaning. Yeah, you can still have fun. You can try and pursue your your goals, whatever they may be. But I'm pretty sure there's no special meaning and trying to to find it also doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yeah. For me, like l life is both meaningless and meaningful for just being here, trying to to make not necessarily the most of it, but the things that make you make you happy, both short term and also long term. Yeah, it seems to be full of cool stuff to enjoy. It if, certainly does. <laughs> and uh, one of those is having a conversation with you, uh, Magnus. It's a huge honor to talk to you. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I can't wait to see what you do in this world. And thank you for creating so much elegance and beauty on the chessboard and beyond. So thanks for talking today, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say this at the start, but I never get, really got the chance. I was always a bit apprehensive about doing this podcast because you are a very smart guy and your audience is very smart. And I always had a bit of imposter syndrome. So I'll tell you this now after <laughs> yeah. the podcast. So please do do judge me, but I, I hope you've enjoyed it. I loved it. You're a brilliant man. And it, it's I love the fact you have imposter syndrome because a lot of us do. And so that that's beautiful to see, even at the very top, you still feel like an imposter. Uh, thank you, brother. Thanks for talking today. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Magnus Carlson. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, let me leave you with some words from Bobby Fischer. Chess is a war over the board. The object is to crush the opponent's mind. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.